So hello and welcome to this MPTO course entitled 20th Century Fiction where we're looking at Virginia Woolf's novel Mrs. Dalloway. So this will be the second last lecture on this novel after which we'll finish this formally. So we're looking at this section, we just finished um, studying a particular passage last time where we looked at how uh, this shell shock soldier Septimus Warren Smith is advised by his doctor that he must be forced to rest. And the whole combination of coercion and confinement and rest cure is something which is obviously uh, suffered by Septimus uh, quite, quite uh, terribly and that obviously in, um, informs his existential alienation, the fact that he's misunderstood and also is confined against his own will. And it also poses some very important questions about the role of agency, right? So the, uh, the sufferer or the patient has very little agency in the hands of the doctors who essentially decide for him, who essentially uh, formulate for him, who essentially you know, decide what's best for him at that point in time. So there's no real empathy at play over here. There's some sympathy and there's a lot of patronizing and condescending gaze, uh, which obviously, um, you know, um, accentuates the suffering of the patient over here. So we see the section over here where Septimus is obviously in that kind of a medical space uh, where he's almost confined and how that uh, informs his trauma, how that informs his alienation and how that actually sends him triggers uh, traumatic triggers which uh, you know make him worse, make him significantly worse than what he is normally. So this should be on your screen. Going and coming, beckoning, signaling, so the light and shadow which now made the world grey. Now the bananas bright yellow, now made the stand grey. Now made the omnibuses bright yellow. Seemed to Septimus Warren Smith lying on a sofa in the sitting room, watching the water, watery gold glow and fade with the astonishing sensibility of some live creature on the roses and the wallpaper. So again, it's a very cinematic quality about the visual image over here. So going and coming, beckoning, signaling, very automated movements. And we've seen how in modernism the relationship between automatism and human senses is very, very complex. Uh, automatism is something which informs the human sensory uh, program. So in the sense that you know, the way we consume stimulus becomes good automatic in quality, right? So the whole idea of coming, going, beckoning, signaling, and the omnibus is coming and going and the road uh, becomes a massive cinema show for Septimus, which is obviously visually consumed by him. Uh, outside the trees, uh, trees dragged their leaves like nets through the depths of the air. The sound of water was in the room and through the waves came the voices of birds singing. Every power bore his treasures on his head and his hand lay there on the back of the sofa as he had seen his hand lie when he was bathing, floating on the top of the waves. While far away on shore he heard the dogs barking and barking far away. Fear no more, says a heart in the body, fear no more. So we have a sense of uh, cognitive dissonance over here, right? So this complete break from reality. Uh, the different kinds of cognitive registers at play. So he's transported back in time, he's transported back to the memories of his war, which obviously uh, makes the presence felt even in this post-war situation. And, and different kinds of signifiers combine, uh, and this is how the traumatic trigger operates. Uh, he sees certain things, he hears certain things, and those uh, experiences trigger certain memories in him, uh, memories of the war. Uh, so he just sits there uh, like a very numbed organism, consuming all kinds of stimulus around him. He was not afraid. At every moment, nature signified by some laughing hint, like the gold spot which went round the wall. There, there, there. Her determination to show by brandishing her plumes, shaking her tresses, flinging her mantle this way and that, beautifully, always beautifully, and standing close up to breathe through her hollowed hands, Shakespeare's words, her meaning. So Shakespeare becomes a marker of meaning over here. Shakespeare becomes a marker of high meaning, high existential meaning. So we saw even before, uh, when Septimus went to fight in the war, he went, he went to protect the land of Shakespeare. So Shakespeare becomes the uh, signifier of culture, meaning, uh, almost metaphysical quality of meaning. And that's something which is uh, used and evoked over and over again uh, by Septimus. Rezia, sitting on the table, twisting her hat in her hands, watched him, saw him smiling. He was happy then, but she could not bear to see him smiling. It was not marriage. It was not being one's husband. It looked strange like that. Always to be starting, laughing, sitting hour after hour, silent, or clutching her and telling her to write. The table drawer was full of those writings about war, about Shakespeare, about great discoveries, how there's no death. So again, uh, this is the first time in the, in the novel where we talk about, where we get a glimpse of Shakespeare, uh, Septimus's writings. Now obviously, as you can see, these are writings which are 
uh, disparaged by the uh, medical practitioners. Uh, the doctors brought Holmes and Bradshaw that look at the writing as some kind of a morbid, uh, you know, over introspective exercise, something which is uh, definitely discouraged by, by them. Whereas when you see uh, the entire idea of Freud and psychoanalysis was an, an entirely, you know, it was advising patients to convert the trauma into an experience, into a narrative uh, in some form. So give it some kind of a tangible shape through a narrative shape, through a narrative design. In contrast to which we have Holmes and Bradshaw, who are the pre-Freudian uh, materialist uh, medical philosophers or uh, medical practitioners uh, who say, and this should be on the screen, both Dr. Holmes and Sir William Bradshaw said excitement was the worst thing for him. So again, the whole idea of excitement being something bad. Uh, so in, being emotional is, is, seen, is still seen as something which is uh, anathema to healthy, uh, healthy existence. So you know, not being excited is a good thing. So they, they obviously, uh, they're colluding together to make him as unexcited or non-excited as possible. Uh, so it's starting being a bad thing, medically speaking, at that point of time. Okay, so um, lately he had been excited suddenly for no reason and waved his hand and cried out that he knew the truth. He knew everything. That man, his friend who was killed, Evans had come, he said. He was singing behind the screen. She wrote it down just as he spoke it. Some things were very beautiful, others sheer nonsense. And he was always stopping in the middle, changing his mind, wanting to add something, hearing something new, listening with his hand up but she heard nothing. So again, we have a complete uh, uh, crisis of communication over here, and, and collapse of communication, if you will. And if you remember the, the line from Fire Sermon in the Wasteland, where again, we have this conversation or the lack of conversation between a married couple, genteel married couple, where we are told repeatedly there's no communication at all. There's a complete failure and collapse of any communicative register, okay? Now, over here, we find that Septimus goes on a rambling spree. He mentions different things randomly. Uh, different references come up in his narrative. And from um, an Aurasius perspective, this uh, almost sounds like a madman's uh, rant. Uh, and the question of Evans comes up, the reference to Evans comes up. So we have talked about how Evans is a character who is a bit of a spectral, ghostly presence in this particular story. He doesn't appear except as a dead man in Septimus's imagination. But we already see instances of how there are, there are very suggestive hints uh, where Evans and Septimus seem to have had some kind of relationship which may have spilled over uh, into something homoerotic in quality. And we see that reference coming over and over again. But the more important thing over here is Septimus appears as a mad prophet, uh, someone who knows everything, knows the truth for the matter. He is a mad seer of truth. But of course, no one would believe him. No one would take him seriously because he is a mad man and he is uh, traumatized by his experiences. So you have this very interesting uh, equation we made between trauma and wisdom, between trauma and insight. So you can only have insight in a condition like this if you experience trauma, right? So trauma becomes uh, something which informs insight rather than something which takes away meaning. It actually adds to meaning. It adds to the only true meaning with which you can look at life. Right, so that becomes a very interesting equation over here. Okay, uh, and once they found the girl who did the room reading, one of those papers and fits of laughter, it was a dreadful pity, for that made Septimus cry out about human cruelty, how they tear each other to pieces. The fallen, he said, they tear to pieces. Holmes is on us, he would say, and he would invent stories about Holmes, Holmes eating porridge, Holmes reading Shakespeare, making him roar with laughter or rage. Dr. Holmes seemed to stand for something horrible for him. Human nature, he called him, and there were the divisions. He was drowned, he used to say, and lying on a cliff with the gulls screaming over him. He would look over the side of the, the edge of the sofa down into the sea, or he was hearing music. Really, it was only a battle organ or some man carrying crying in the street. But lovely, he used to cry, and the tears would run down his cheeks, with, which was to her the most dreadful thing of all, to see a man like Septimus who had fought, who was brave, crying. Okay, now there are different things which need to be unpacked over here. So Holmes becomes obviously the, uh, the opposite of happiness, the anathema to happiness. Uh, Holmes is something who is a tyrant over here, is a medical tyrant, uh, who is a bit of a medical uh, fascist for the matter, who wants to control and coerce and confine Septimus and take him away from his free will, take him away from what he wants to do. Uh, so whenever he feels traumatized, whenever he feels uh, put upon, he always evokes the image of Holmes in his mind. Holmes is on us. Holmes is something who's chasing us down, breathing down our neck, for the matter. Uh, Holmes is reading Shakespeare. Holmes is eating porridge. So Holmes becomes this marker uh, for mercilessness uh, in this particular section, right? 
Uh, and then, of course, uh, we hear different things later. We also get to see that Septimus cries often, you know, cries out of joy, cries out of uh, you know, trauma, etc. And from Raziel's perspective, it is very, very uh, almost impossible to see Septimus cry because Septimus, to her, uh, becomes the epitome of manliness, military manliness. And to see him reduced uh, to a figure uh, who is sobbing, who is crying, is something which is almost unbearable uh, for Raziel. In case, there is this question of emasculation as well. Uh, so we have different kinds of equations over here, trauma, wisdom, inside emasculation, guilt, all put together and that makes Septimus's character such a complex character to look at. Okay, uh, right. And he would lie listening until suddenly he would cry, uh, he would, that he was falling down, down into the flames. So, you know, we have this very interesting uh, post-traumatic stress disorder uh, images over here. He, he imagines himself falling into a flame, he imagines himself being burnt to death, etc. Right. Actually, she would look for flames. It was so vivid, but there was nothing. They were alone in the room. It was a dream. She would tell him and so quiet him at last. But sometimes she was frightened too. She sighed as she sat sewing. Right? So she, he has all these traumatic visions at night. He has his traumatic triggers at night. He'd wake up. Uh, he would picture himself drowning. He would picture himself uh, you know, being chased by someone. And then she would have to tell him that this was just a dream. But, you know, and then go back to sleep. But we are told that uh, Septimus's recollections over here, Septimus's uh, triggers over here are so vivid, so visceral in quality that it was almost uh, you know, very, very real for Razi as well. And he was also scared uh, despite not dreaming those uh, herself. Okay. Her sigh was tender and enchanting, like the wind outside of wood in the evening. Now she put down her scissors, now she turned to take something from the table, a little stir, a little crinkling, a little tapping built up somewhere, something on the table there where she started sewing. Through his eyelashes, he could see the blurred outline, her little black body, her face and hands, her turning movements at the table. As she shook up a reel or looked, she was apt to those things. For a silk, she was making a hat for Mrs. Filmer's married daughter, whose name was, he'd forgotten her name. Now suddenly we have a, a reversal of gaze. So we like, took a look at Razia over here uh, from Septimus' perspective. So we have different kind of focal points in this narrative as we have mentioned already, which makes it almost postmodern quality, despite being a so temporally, historically speaking, modernist novel. Because we have all these interlinked, uh, hyperlinked narratives where the focal points, the focal characters change quite quickly and quite dramatically. So suddenly we see Razia being looked at, uh, Septimus looking at her uh, from a certain perspective, right? So and we get to know what she is doing. Okay. Uh, what is the name of Mrs. Filmer's married daughter? Uh, he asks. Mrs. Peters, said Razia. She was afraid that it was too small, she said, holding it over her, holding it before her. Uh, Mrs. Peters was a big woman, but she did not like her. It was only because Mrs. Filmer had been so good to them. She gave me grapes this morning, she said. Then Razia wanted to do something to, to show that they were grateful. She had come into the room on the other evening and found Mrs. Peters, who thought they were out playing the gramophone. What is true? he asks. And she was playing the gramophone? Yes. She had told him about it at the time she found Mrs. Peters playing the gramophone. He began very cautiously to open his eyes to see whether a gramophone was really there. But real things, real things were too exciting. He must be cautious. So again, the whole idea of looking at real things becomes uh, exciting for him. And, and obviously, he's been advised. He's been, uh, you know, almost coerced into thinking that excitement is bad for him. Right? So he wants to avoid excitement at all costs. But real things, real things are too exciting. He must be cautious. He would not go mad. First, he looked at the fashion papers in a lower shelf. Then suddenly and gradually, the gramophone with a green trumpet. Nothing could be more exact. And still gathering courage, he looked at the sideboard, the plate of bananas, the engraving of Queen Victoria and the Prince Consort at the mantelpiece with a jar of roses. Nothing of these, uh, the, nothing of these things moved. All was still, all were real. So you have different markers of uh, uh, wealth, different markers of prestige in this room. The gramophone, you have a, uh, you know, the queer, the picture of a queen. Uh, they, there's a, the whole idea of this very bourgeois, genteel setting is played out over here. And you know, we also told that all this feels very real, all very real. She is a woman with a spiteful tongue, said Razia. What does Mr. Peters do? Septimus asks. Ah, said Razia, trying to remember. She thought Mr. Filmer had said he'd travel in for some company. Just now he is in Hull, she said. Okay, so now we have this idea of this traveling man as well. So we have different kinds of male models over here. So, and interestingly, we find most of the able-bodied men in this novel are absent from the narrative. They just mentioned their third-person presences. They're talked about, they're mentioned, but they're not really there uh, when, you know, the characterization takes place. Okay. Uh, 
Now, uh, then we see this very interesting uh, example of a traumatic trigger in Septimus. So, you know, he sees something perfectly innocuous, and that triggers him into believing something, which he thought he had forgotten. He started up in terror. What did he see? The plate of bananas on a sideboard. Nobody was there. A banana was a very uh, common fruit away here in, in this confined uh, in this uh, rescue method. People were fed bananas against their will. Uh, because bananas are supposed to help you put on put on weight, and Virginia Woolf herself were, was fed banana for the longest time when she suffered this confinement cure uh, as a child, as, as someone who was a young woman. He started up in terror. What did he see? Uh, the plate of bananas on the side bed. Nobody was there. Rezi had taken the child to his mother. It was bedtime. That was it, to be alone forever. That was a doom pronounced in Milan. When he came to this room he, and saw them cutting out buckram shapes with the scissors, to be alone forever. So that obviously accentuates the alienation suffered by Septimus. He experiences the alienation that he suffers medically, culturally, socially, politically as well. Right. So all these become uh, very, very, uh, it's snowball into this idea of being completely cut out from uh, the reality around him. Okay. He was alone with the sideboard and the bananas. He was alone, exposed on this bleak eminence, stretched out, but not on a hilltop, not on a crag, on Mrs. Filmer's sitting room sofa. As for the visions, the faces, the voices of the dead, what were they? Where were they? There was a screen in front of him with black bulrushes and blue swallows, where he had once seen mountains, where he had seen faces, where he had seen beauty. There was a screen, right? So the whole idea of screen becomes important because that obviously flags up the cinematic quality, uh, the visual consumption over here. Evans, he cried. There was no answer. A mouse had squeaked, or a rustle, uh, or, or, or a curtain uh, rustled. There were the voices of the dead. The screen, the the the, the coal kettle, the main, the, the sideboard reminded to him, uh, remained to him. Let him face, uh, then face the screen, the coal scuttle and the sideboard. But Razia burst from the room, chattering. Some letter had come. Everybody's plans were changed. Mrs. Filmer would not be able to grow to Brighton after all. There was no time to let Mrs. Williams know, and, he, and really, Razia uh, thought it very, very annoying when she caught sight of the hat and thought, perhaps she might just make another little, and a voice died in contented melody. Ah, oh, damn, she cried. It was a joke of theirs, a swearing. The needle had broken, hard child brightened needle. She built it up first. First one thing, then the other. She built it up sewing. So this breaking of the needle becomes a very symbolic act. It becomes part of the Sisyphean existence uh, of Rezia. You know what a Sisyphean existence is? The myth of Sisyphus is someone who's cursed, who's doomed to push the stone up a hill, and obviously the moment it reaches the top of the hill, the stone's going to roll over and fall again, and he has to do it ad infinitum to the end of eternity. Okay, so there's a degree of Sisyphean existence about these characters as well. Okay. Uh, she wanted him to say whether by moving the rose she had improved the hat. She sat on the boat uh, on, the, on the end of the sofa, right? So she's making a hat and she's putting a rose in it and she wants Septimus' approval because approval comes from a sense of engagement, from a sense of uh, empathy. You engage with something through an empathic process and then you uh, approve or disapprove it for the matter. Okay, uh, they were perfectly happy now, she said, suddenly uh, putting the hat down, for she could say anything to him now. She could say whatever came into her head. That was a, there was a most, almost the first thing she had felt about him, the night in a cafe when he had come in with his English friends. He had come by rather shyly looking around him, and his hat had fallen with it where he hung it up. Then that, that she could remember. Uh, she knew he was English, though no one of the last Englishmen had sister admired, for he was always ten, but he had a beautiful fresh colour. Uh, but, and with the, and his bright nose, his bright eyes, his way of sitting a little hunched made him made her think. Uh, she had often told him of a young hawk the first evening when she saw him, when they were playing dominoes, then he had come in uh, of a young hawk, uh, but with, the, with her he was always very gentle. So the hawk metaphor is important because the hawk is traditionally the bird predator, right? So the hawk is a predatory bird, someone who, uh, you know, something which, which you know, preys on other smaller birds and, and other smaller organisms such as fish for the matter. So the hawk metaphor is obviously in connection to a variety of military masculinity which is wild in quality, it is very epitome of maleness and hunter, the hunter male, right? Now we see the transition over here very, very quickly, uh, but we also told that with her, he was very, always very gentle. She never seen him wild or drunk, only suffering sometimes through this terrible war. And even so, but even so, when she came in, she put it all away, anything, anything in the whole world any little bother with her work, anything that struck her uh, to say that she would tell him uh, and he understood at once. Her own family ever, uh, even were not the same. Being older than she was and being so clever, how serious he was, wanting her to read Shakespeare before her, she could even grasp a little child story in English. 
being so much more experienced, uh, he could help her and she too could help him. So we have this moment of optimism in the story when Reza realizes that despite everything, Septimus is a lovely man. Septimus is a very, very uh, qualitatively rich man and he can help her in a way that she can help him so they can live in a mutually helpful relationship. But it's hard now and then it was getting late, Sir William Bradshaw and then Sir William Bradshaw. He he she held her hands to her head waiting for him to say, uh, he did he like the hat or not? And as she sat there, waiting, looking down, she, he could feel her mind like a bird falling from branch to branch and always uh, flightening, uh, always alighting, sorry, r r quite rightly. He could follow her mind as she sat there in one of those uh, loose tax boxes, uh, you know, the process that came to her naturally. And if he could say anything at once, she smiled like a bird alighting with all his claws firm upon the bow. So again, the bird image becomes important. Uh, and you know, the bird obviously is equated with uh, Razio here and we saw the hawk equated with, uh, you know, uh, Septimus Smith. But I remembered Bradshaw and said, these people were um, almost fond of rest, but were not good for us when we were ill. Bradshaw said he must be taught to rest. Bradshaw said he must be separated. So again, the whole idea of emotional uh, apathy becomes important because Bradshaw's cure for Septimus apparently is to separate him from his wife. And that obviously, and that is supposedly uh, the reason, that, the way in which he can be cured. So we can see the absurdity of the entire medical exercise. We can see the coercive quality of this entire medical exercise uh, at play. Uh, and the word must is of course picked up over here by Septimus. Must, must, why must? What power had Brasho over him? What rights is Brasho to say must to me, he demanded. So again, this brings some very complicated questions about the doctor-patient uh, relationship and how the agency becomes a very problematic category in that relationship, right? If a doctor tells you to do something, you don't normally have the agency to say no because the doctor is doing it for your betterment of your body, right? So the entire system becomes uh, dependent on the doctor, right? So. Uh, so Septimus wonders why Brasher uses the word must so many times. A sense of, uh, you know, imperious qualities there, very much so, in the way he practices medicine. Okay? So, it's because you're talking of killing yourself, said Razia. Mercifully, she could now say anything to Septimus. So, it's, we were asked to be separated because you're thinking of committing suicide. And the doctor thinks that me staying with you might aggravate your condition. Again, the doctor says it's been the operative phrase over here. So, he was in the power. Holmes and Brasher were on him. The brutal, uh, the brute with the red nostrils was sniffing into every secret place. Must, he, uh, it could say, what, what were his papers uh, in, in the things that he had, it, he, had, he had written. So, you know, the whole idea of, uh, you know, being away from uh, family, being away from uh, every loved ones becomes important over here. Because Holmes and Bradshaw, they represent a lovelessness of the landscape. It's a very loveless landscape. So, Septimus suffers, among other things, from lovelessness, right? And hence his entire morbid introspection and narcissism. Okay. She brought him his papers, the things he had, he had written, things she had written for him. She felt to tumble down uh, out on, onto a march, uh, onto a sofa. They looked at him together, uh, they looked at them together, diagrams, designs, little men and women brandishing sticks for arms with wings. Were they? On the backs, circles traced around shillings and sixpences, the suns and the stars, zigzagging precipices with uh, mountaineering ascending ropes together like knives and forks. Uh, sea pieces with little faces bursting out with what might perhaps be waves, the map of the world. Uh, so the whole idea, look at the way in which these connections are made, so everything ends up being the map of the world. So from some, something very local, it moves on to something very, very philosophical and macro in quality. Burn them, he, he cried. Now for his writings, now the dead sing b uh, behind the Rodendaran house, uh, the, the Rodendaran bushes, Oods of Time, conversations with Shakespeare, Evans, 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 his message from the dead, do not cut down the trees. Tell the Prime Minister, universal love, the meaning of the world, bird them, he cried. So this is what we call uh, very famously the stream of consciousness technique, where one meaning takes up different meanings, where one meaning moves on another meaning, which may or may not have a relationship between them at all, right? So this entire lack of dependence of meaning is something which is important for us to say over here, that, you know, uh, in a world where language is taken away, he might as well have been burned to death, okay? So that becomes an important uh, message over here. But Razia had laid her hands on him. Some were very beautiful, she thought. Uh, she would tie them up uh, for she had no envelope with a, piece of, with a piece of silk. Even if they took him, she said, she would go with him. They could not separate them against the walls, she said. So if you remember, uh, Septimus and Razia were told that Septimus was taken away to, Mrs., uh, to Dr. Bradshaw's, uh, you know, uh, you know, Dr. Bradshaw's chamber in the countryside. That would be obviously be uh, a part of the confinement method, 
Okay, so and the husband and the wife will be forced to stay separately. They will not be allowed to come in together. Uh, because that was supposed to create too much excitement, which is bad for the nerves of the patients, according to these doctors. Okay. Um, shuffling the edges straight, the, the did of the papers, and tied of the parcel almost without not noting, uh, almost without looking, sitting beside him. He thought as if all her petals were about her. She was a flowering tree, and through her branches looked over the face of a lawgiver, who had reached a sanctuary where she feared no one. No one except, no, not Holmes, nor Bradshaw, a miracle, a triumph, the last and greatest. Staggering, he saw the he saw her mount uh, the appalling staircase, laden with, um, you know, la laden with Holmes and Bradshaw, um, men who never weighed less than eleven stone six, who sent the wives to the coat, and men who met ten thousand a year, and uh, talked in proportion, who made it, who different in different articles and different in their verdicts, and for Holmes and said for Bradshaw and other yet judges they were who with mixed vision and skateboard, she saw nothing clear and yet ruled, yet inflicted, must, he said, over them, she triumphed. Now, over here, what is important for us to see how the collective is important than the individual, right? So the collective over here happens to be Holmes and Bradshaw, and obviously they have uh, a much more coercive technique compared to the individual, right? So the coercion is important for us to understand. So the word must comes back again. The word must is an indica indication of the coercion, indication of the terrorism, the force that the medical practitioners are imposing on him. There, she said, the papers are tied up. No one should get at them. She would put them away, right? So the writing of certain must becomes important, and this is something which we see in, uh, in great detail. So here. the writing becomes the only activity in which any exercise of agency can be operated, can be uh, can be can be can be operated can be can be offered. So if the writing goes away. Uh, you know that takes with the agency as well. So you know there she said the papers were tied up. No one should get at them. She would put them away. And she said nothing should separate them. She sat down beside him and called him by the name of the hawk or crow, which being the malicious and a great destroyer of crops was precisely like him. No one could separate them, she said. Now, interestingly, we find that the bird metaphors are used very, very interestingly. Hawk is a predatory bird. Hawk is something which preys on things. But of course. Uh, uh, you know, that is used as a malicious and great destroyer of crops uh, and that is something that she equates with him, which is a very interesting question because we see Satyam as being completely devastated and uh, decadent over here. And, but then the, the assumption, the statement over here that Brazier is making is no one could separate them, she said, right? So this lack of separation becomes interesting. So they become essentially inseparable in quality uh, and that is something which they are saying. Now what is interesting is how does inseparability becomes a problem for the doctors? The doctors would say, you know, lack of agency you know, take away the writing, take away the emotions, take away any human contact. That would be their way of purging people out of the emotions because they think emotions over here are the problem. Emotions over here are the, uh, the, the pathological things. So we, have, we find a very important, very interesting uh, medical culture at play over here. Uh, a medical culture based on rationality, hyper-rationality, a medical culture based on uh, you know, the extent to which reason is pushed, uh, that emotions are driven away, basic human empathy is driven away, and that becomes the, the cure method for the doctors over here. Now, we stop at this point today, but we, we see how the entire space is also uh, designed for that kind of a, a medical control, right? So, we, we have these homes that uh, are created by Holmes and Bradshaw, especially Bradshaw, where, you know, the, the, the people are sent to the homes to get cured, to get, to get better. And those homes obviously become the sites of confinement, uh, the sites of terror, the sites where people are coerced into, into becoming better. Uh, and that becomes part of a sanatorium process, which is how this cure, the, you know, this, this rescue method operated, which is obviously did not cure them at all. In the case of Septimus, you find he commits suicide, he kills himself by jumping from a window. And that suicide becomes the only agentic act available to him, the only act, the only uh, bit of agency that he, he has uh, as a suffering subject. So we stop at this point today and we'll continue with this and hopefully we will finish this novel in the next lecture. Thank you for your attention.